Uh, I've never done a panel before. Anyone done a panel before? <laughs> well, we're just going to ask questions, really. So, um, uh, cool. Uh, let's get some mics from these folks. <clears throat> Um, so first off, I mean, I'd be interested just to know, like, what, what is like, what is a little bit of the uh, process of you know working together? It's obviously a lot of remote, but like, what is what is the interaction between the development team on a daily basis? What, what does it look like? Is it email list? Is it other stuff? I mean, like, how, how do you actually interact when you're pushing code from, you know, from one one person's development to another? It's both. I mean, it's mostly on the dev list, but sometimes things we take off dev list when it's just too noisy. Um, there's some direct, you know, direct contact a lot with yeah. me and some of the other developers, but we try to keep most of it public with, as much as possible so that people can see what's going on with the, the process. Um, it can be a little chaotic at times. The, the dev list can be kind of noisy, but. Okay, great. Uh, and also, Alvaro just had a great first question. Uh, who are you? <laughs> so why don't you just go down the line. Tom, Tom why don't you start? So I'm just a random electronics engineer. Uh, I do mostly FPGAs and embedded systems for my living. Started with KiCad several years ago. And since then, I became a KiCad developer. It kind of became entangled with, uh, with my uh, work since my company embraced, uh, not necessarily embraced, but decided to, to support KiCad. And that's how it all started. I feel like... Hmm? <laughs> Tom. Oh. That My was Tom. Is Tom Wostowski, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think your mic is quieter than mine. Okay. I feel like I just got introduced, but hi, I'm John. Uh, I also am an electronics engineer in my day job. I mostly do embedded systems and uh, management, things like that. You're going to have to hand the mic over to Orson now. Hi everyone, I'm Matthias Minsky, widely known as Orson, uh, and I have been lucky to, 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 to be hired to work on KiCad, like almost full time at CERN. So yeah, I'm a daily C++ programmer, and now I'm just contributing to KiCad. You guys already heard my story. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Seth. I just gave a talk, so if you missed it, I'm a design engineer for uh, UC Davis, and I um, use KiCad to design circuits, and every now and again, I find something that uh, it doesn't quite do the way I want it to, and uh, I try to uh, fix that, I try and smooth out some uh, rough edges where they exist, which are so few, and they're few and far between. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I'm Adam Wolf, and I make open hardware and other things like that. And I started using this program maybe 10 years ago, and I had things like, hey, there's no shortcut for making a label. So we decided to do that, and then somehow I got sucked in and haven't, haven't left since. So um, lately I've been doing the Mac OS package stuff for maybe the last Four years, four years or so. Wow, that number keeps getting bigger. Um, anyway. Okay, great. We got a question back here. Yeah, sure. Hi. So one thing I really like about KiCad over many other packages is how the footprint of a part is not married to the schematic symbol, and I feel like a lot of packages get that wrong. So one thing I've noticed in the um, in in some of the library um, components and I've heard some people grumbling about how CVPCB is obsolete. What's the future plan for you know, CVPCB and associating footprints with schematic symbols? Well, C CVPCB is not obsolete. It's just no longer a standalone application. It's just, it basically is a child window of the schematic process. So, well, actually, it could be any process, but right now it's, it's tied to the schematic. So you can still, you can still run CVPCB just not as a standalone application. So you just run it from the schematic editor. It's still there, as far as I know. Did we take it out recently and I, I missed that? <laughs> no, no, it's, it's there. I mean, it's just not a standalone app anymore. Um, Y'all sounded like a 12-step program to start with, by the way. Hi, my name is. Um, how did CERN get involved in all this? How did CERN involved uh, in, uh, in all this? 
So it was like early 2010, maybe 2011. We were, we were starting uh, our open hardware initiative at CERN. So open hardware making our designs publicly available under an open license. And we realized one of the uh, key challenges to efficiently collaborating on open hardware projects, especially between different institutions, uh, was uh, EDA software. For instance, uh, CERN uh, has licenses for Altium and Cadence. Somebody in uh, uh, a German lab uh, uses uh, Mentor Graphics. Uh, someone else uses Zucan, Pads, and so on and so forth. Moving designs between these tools, uh, it is possible, but uh, you can never be sure that one tool will read a file exported by another one without, without uh, troubles. So, we decided to devote a bit of time to one of uh, uh, open source uh, EDA applications, uh, hoping that uh, this will let us collaborate on, uh, on open hardware uh, designs uh, more easily. And uh, after uh, doing a, a review of what was available uh, and how major were the projects uh, in uh, 2010, we decided to go for KiCad. Oh, I, I just, I want to, I didn't answer, I don't think I answered the previous question about the libraries. You were going to ask, uh, you wanted to know what was, what, what we were going to, what was our view on libraries. I don't think we're going to change how we've been doing libraries in the past. I, I know there's this, there's kind of two schools of thought on libraries. There's the atomic, everything gets squished into one, you know, part library, and there it has all the stuff that you would want for that one part. In theory, that works good, but it's a lot of overhead to do it that way. Whereas right now, you know, we have basically, you have a, it's a more generic where you assign the footprint to the symbol. I don't see that changing. Not that we couldn't do that, and not that people couldn't offer libraries like that, but I don't think as far as the project itself, offering libraries like that, I don't know how much sense it makes for us to do that. It, I just don't, you know, I, I understand the arguments for, I, I call them atomic libraries. I understand the arguments for that, but practically speaking, for the way the librarians work, I don't think it's, you know, I don't see that happening. You know, I think things will stay the way they are. Yeah, I thought that's, and I realized I didn't answer the question, so yeah. All right, go ahead. All right. Uh, one of the things that I think KiCad really uh, brings to the table is how extensible it is, both through, like, the scripting interface and the fact that there's a lot of, like, third-party tools and it's easy to build your own tools that directly work with the file formats. So with, like, some of the changes that are coming in version 6, such as improved scriptability and file format changes, what else are you guys thinking of to improve the extensibility of KiCad to make it... Uh, even like, like, what's the plans to make KiCad more extensible so that it's easier for me or anyone to develop their own tools? Well, I think I think the um, having a, a an abstract layer Python wrapper around the low level sw swig wrappers is going to help a lot because in the past we've you know as you know KiCad developed you know KiCad moves pretty fast. So there's a lot of low level um, API changes that just happen naturally over time as we add more features, as we improve things, find things that are wrong. So we break a lot. I mean, it's not uncommon for somebody to make a change to like some of the lower level PCB objects and break somebody's Python script. So if we can wrap that and then hide that breakage behind a, a, an AP, you know, a pure Python wrapper, I think that'll help a lot. You know, when I, and the other thing too is obviously we have not provided that yet for the schematic editor. So none of it, you can't, there's a, you know, there's a, a lot of usage, there's a lot of places where Python scripting will be useful in, in the schematic and the, in the symbol libraries. So that's coming in version six. So th I think those two things should help a lot. Um, I spend a lot of time doing bomb reconciliation when I make a revision to uh, one of my boards. And I was wondering, uh, it seems that you can export, uh, you know, a CSV from KiCad 
Um, but then that, that gets stale, and I have to then, and, you know, and I have to add like my manufacturer part numbers, and I have to add all the information so I can get it actually made. And then I'll go, and you know, in a, two weeks later, I'll I'll, revi I'll make a revision to it. I'll add a component or something, and I have to make a new CSV to edit that. And I have to go and like reconcile this new CSV, and I found that I spend a lot of time doing that. And uh, it's I've missed parts, and you know, things have gotten wrong. Uh, and it just seems like there's a really big potential for error in going from like a a, bar, a board that's updating and iterating with uh, you know, bomb reconciliation and, and getting that right on the first try. Do you have any advice on how to do that or any plans to make like a, a dynamic sort of file that can be exported into what the uh, manufacturers actually want? So is, is it about a pick and place machine or is it about the bill of materials? Uh, the bill of materials. Bill of materials. All right, so I think the easiest way is to add another plugin. In eSchema, when you open the bill of materials generator, you have a list of plugins, right? So perhaps you just need to take one of these and customize them, because you are just missing some fields uh, that are available in the symbols, right? And are not saved in the CSV file. Is that true, or? Uh, yeah, I guess the CSV file comes out very underpopulated. All right, so I think the, the best way is to modify one of the plugins and just modify it in the way that suits you. Okay, and one of the plugins is, is uh, like one of the bomb to CSV things? Yeah. There's, uh, there's actually two ways to do it. Probably the best way to do it is with the Python plugins. You can take, there's actually a couple samples. If, I mean, I think if you go in and look where your, the, the bomb generation pub plugins are, because the problem, the reason we don't have it, we used to have a standardized interface and it was just a mess way back when, right? Because you, you can pick any five people out of this room, 10 people, and everybody has their own idea what a bomb looks like, right? So we got to the point where it was just, people were screaming, nobody was happy. So we said, okay, maybe we should approach this from a different angle. And that angle was, okay, we'll provide basic like CSV type output for, you know, tab separated, whatever and give you the base to be able to customize them any way you want. And so, yeah, if you go in and look in where the Python samples are, I think there's a couple samples in there that allow, that give you hints. There's actually, I think in the comments, isn't there? I think there's yep. actually in the comments, will tell you if you just want to add these fields to your, to your, because we don't, we don't know what fields you're going to add. If I, I mean, I, if it's, I'll just give you a perfect example how comical it actually is. You know, a lot of people like, uh, manufacturer part number, so MPN, right? Well, that would work for like two people. And the other, these guys will want manufacturer spelled out, part number, because their, you know, their billing system, that's what that uses, right? So there's 10 different ways to do that. And if, if we fix that in KiCad, then basically nobody's, the two guys that got what they wanted are happy and nobody else is. So we've, we, we've kind of made that really generic and then left that up to the user because we find that things like bombs and that kind of you know customizable user output. It, everybody has a different way of doing it. So it, you, you, if you can't, you couldn't get anybody to sit down and agree on a standard for naming the fields, the extra fields. You know the user definable fields. So okay, I, I didn't know that. I've been going to the PCB new and outputting the bomb there. So I'll, no, I'll you go. should you should output the bomb from the schematic editor. It's ah. it's a lot more complete. Okay. Yeah, awesome. yeah. The, the user, the user. Fields in the in the schematic editor don't get exported to the, the footprint the, the board editor. They're not they they, they would have no use in the board editor. And then there's also some really good third party tools for this. Um, the speaker from this morning with the Skittle stuff maintains a list on GitHub of like awesome third party tools for KiCad or KiCad. And uh, I like I think it, is it is it key cost has this really super awesome web interface, Excel interface for managing this type of stuff, and it, it might be kind of close to what you're looking for. As my uh, hardware development team has grown, I've found myself um, having to resolve a lot of merge conflicts, uh, specifically uh, most often with KiCad PCB files. And I'm curious, 
to know your perspective as developers of KiCad, but especially as users of KiCad, uh, when you've collaborated with teams on electronic designs, uh, what best practices do you have for using Git or uh, other collaborative version control tools? So, uh, did you ask this question on Twitter too? <laughs> it's calling you out. Someone did. Um, so, the unfortunately, so I'll, I'll give you the bad news first. Um, we have uh, cruft in the uh, in the files. You know this. The good news is, Git provides you with all of the tools you need to ignore all of that cruft <laughs> in your commits. Um, and there are two commands, git smudge and git clean. Um, and these correspond to the checkouts and the, uh, and, and the pushes. Um, and so what, what you want to do, and, and I'll just, I mean, because we're just talking, I mean, if you want to catch me afterwards, but you set up scripts that run um, when you check it out, you smudge it, right? And then you clean it before you, uh, before you check it back in. This allows you to maintain local changes that don't go out to the repository. So the local changes in, say, the KiCad PCB file are going to be uh, things like, you know, we accidentally export a bit field that contains information about whether the net was highlighted when you saved it. Oops. Uh, we export um, the number of tracks in the board file. Yeah, this, this sort of thing um, gets, gets updated automatically when it opens, but it generates a lot of churn in the, uh, in, the, in the Git files, and you'll get merge conflicts that way. You minimize those. It won't get rid of your merge conflicts, but you minimize those by, uh, by smudging those differences um, when, when, and, then, and then cleaning before you, before you push. So uh, there's a secondary answer on this as well. All right. I have a question on that. Oh, my God. We, had a, we have that mic on first. Oh, yeah. I, I can repeat the question if, that's, if, if, it's, if it's related. So, right. So, what? Uh, so, the related question: If you change a non-labeled net to a labeled net, um, well, that's a big change. Um, in that, in that, um, that changes how all of the uh, all of the related nets carry uh, get get their naming, and so the naming convention will propagate to. Uh, will we'll propagate forward, and that might also have connected you to some other nets as well. And the, oh, and the un oh right, yes, of course. And then because the numbering starts over again, right? And there are, there are a number of other things like that. Net numbering can be smudged out because you don't actually care what the actual number of the unlabeled nets is. And there is a very specific format for, as for the net names that are automatically numbered. And so you can smudge out those numbers and then just create a linear numbering system when you, uh, when, when, when you, check, uh, when you check it out. Um, this is one, one, way of go one way of going about it. Um, setting this up is a lot of work. It's not something that we maintain, but it, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's an option for you. And if you're working with a large team, then you know, that, uh, the effort involved in that uh, might, might be worth your while. So. I want to just add a, a non-technical uh, answer in addition to Seth's uh, technical answer, which is one option. Uh, this is a little bit controversial, but just because the PCB file format happens to be text doesn't necessarily mean that it's wise to treat it as text. In my opinion, uh, it does not make sense to merge PCB files together because you don't have an easy way of viewing the changes 
I mean, of course, you can look at A and B, each in their own PCB new window, but that is super error prone. So from a workflow point of view, my advice is to treat it like you can't merge the PCB. Uh, so if you have different team members working on the same PCB, just semaphore it so that, you know, the first one has it and they have the lock on it. And you have to do that out of band if you're using Git because Git won't actually let you lock the file. Um, but if you can't think of a useful way to diff and merge the PCB, then I don't think it's a good idea to actually have Git do that merge. Uh, if I might add a little comment. So <laughs> I wanted to say uh, what uh, John just said, that yeah, essentially all the textual uh, version control systems are made for, uh, for something that, is, uh, that has one dimension. Source code is a text file. It has a single spatial dimension. PCB is, uh, depending if you count the number of layer, the layers as, as separate dimensions, it's a three-dimensional object. So uh, it is possible to do a version management system for PCBs and electrical schematics, but it needs more data to work correctly than what is currently stored uh, in the PCB or the schematic file of KiCad. Uh, luckily, the new canvases in uh, PCB New, they have been designed with that in mind. So basically, one day we could uh, track every change made to the PCB or the schematic later on, uh, log that into a, into a file that contains a logical history of every item and every action. Having this history in some files since the beginning of the design uh, is a necessity, a prerequisite for developing an algorithm that will be able to track the histories of things done by different users, visualize them in, a, in, a, in, a, in an easy to, 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 in an easy way, and then let the user choose how to merge things. That's something that maybe in a few years will happen in KiCad, depending on how much work power we have. <laughs> I don't know. All right, and uh, a short uh, preview for tomorrow, too. Check out Jesse Vinchett's talk. I mean, he's, he's going to be showing some stuff there, too. So uh, one more question. Yeah, I just had a uh, quick question about how you guys prioritize the roadmap. What are the things that you consider when putting it together, and what influences things going on or off of it? I'll take that one. Um, it's kind of, it, it's sort of a, it goes by priority based on what, we have a, you know, we kind of go on based on what we think, well, we, we have a pretty good idea what users are screaming for the most. So we try to prioritize that above other things. We also know that, like, we have to, we have, there's th there are other things that, there are dependencies that those features have to come first. So. And then we basically prioritize things on what we want to accomplish and then manpower. Um, you know, we have to decide, well, you know, Tom's going to work on that and we got to look at his schedule and Seth's going to work on something or I'm going to work on something. So we have to kind of coordinate that. So it's, based, it's, it's kind of a, you know, I have to take a 10,000 foot view of everything and say, okay, what can we get done in a reasonable amount of time? And I pick, I try to pick, I mean, it's not a perfect science, but I try to pick the things that I know are going to give us the biggest bang for our buck and then prioritize them for the next uh, version roadmap. But we're, we, we're constantly tweaking them. I mean, they, they go through lots of revisions. In fact, that's one of the things I'm going to do Monday when I get back home is update the version 6 roadmap because it's woefully out of date. My, my, talk, my, talk present, my presentation is more up to date than the, the roadmap is. So, and then once we kind of finalize that, we'll start thinking about things we want to do for version 7. You know, try to get an idea what the next big hits will be. So. So you heard it here first. If you want to get to Wayne before he, he locks down the road nap, this is the, this is the time to do it. So <laughs> beers, or beers are later. You can, uh, you can have some influence there. I wanted to ask, uh, is anybody looking at speeding up the install process? I don't need to watch line after line of DOS-ish <laughs> uh, individual files being loaded. Oh, this is a window. Oh. There is a Windows. The, uh, Simon isn't here to answer this. Uh, well, I th there's been some talk about splitting out the 
the, the core KiCad, you know, executables into its own kind of package and then splitting out the, the, the libraries because really, right, I know that I think the Windows installer is what, 1.2 gig now? 1.1, 1.2 gig? It's huge. Probably 85% of that, maybe more, is just libraries. That's how big our library system is now. So, you know, you got your 3D models, you got your footprints and all your symbol libraries. So, that's what, that's what you're seeing scroll viral f forever. <laughs> it's all your libraries. And so, I'll, I'll actually hijack one moment here. Um, extending John's talk earlier about how people can help out with the whole, whole thing with KiCad, um, we desperately could use more people interested in packaging. Um, I know it's really flashy to add a new feature in like a whistle, but at the same point, everybody has to install it at some point, and those things are, are touched by everybody. And the other thing that is a real bummer is that if we have a bad install experience, then people are already grumpy before they open up the tool the first time, and it's like, like it's not going to end up with anybody having a good day. Um, so I'm, I mainly work on the Mac OS piece of, of packaging. Uh, but Apple changes about as fast as I'm able to put time into this project. So uh, it's hard for me even to add features even just in that piece. And then beyond Mac OS, we've got Windows and we've got, we've got a million Linuxes and people building it on BSDs by themselves. And like, like we certainly would be able to take any of the help anybody's interested in, you know, in offering up for that type of work as well. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, it's a follow-up question to the library stuff. So uh, I moved from four to five, and the five installer was smaller because it was uh, libraries were stripped, or I had a nightly where libraries were stripped, and then I have to work out how to do library management properly. So I guess uh, um, is there work being done in getting the Git linked up properly and the libraries bring, brought in? in a modular fashion and so on. I like the fact that they have been split off the main and then they're in separate, separate Git. Uh, is there a library management sort of uh, interface in, in coming in? I'll, I'll take that one because, yeah, the, the library management, that's always been an issue because the libraries are changing much, much faster than KiCad itself is changing. So that's an ongoing issue. We have a lot of people who want to know about um, when, when, when I, if I, a lot of people run, in fact, I do myself, I use the, the, the Git libraries from the repo directly, right? And I know that when there's a change, I have to update my symbol library table. And I, I guess, actually, is that your question? Yes. Is, is how, how are we going to manage that going forward? We have talked about it. It's not, it's a non-trivial solution. Um, we're trying to find a way that makes sense. You know, we always have the, when it, like anything, there's always the, especially something that deals with um, file pass. It's non-trivial because you have the cross-platform issues. Um, we have talked about it. We're, we're going to do something. I just don't know what that. I, you know, I haven't had that aha moment on that one yet. I mean, I've had a lot of, I've had a lot of ideas, and, and we've talked a lot about it. But I still don't, still haven't seen the forest through the trees. You know, sometimes you just have to sleep on it a couple times, and it, it comes to you. But we're, we're going. We're, we, it's definitely something we know we need to address. Um, it's just how to do it in a way that painless for the user. So. Hi. Um, this is somewhat also related to this. It's a, it's a small, maybe rather suggestion than, than a question. Uh, I've seen also from 4 to 5 and 5 to 5.1 when you get the libraries installed, it basically like everything breaks and you have to delete the index of all libraries and basically recreate it from what is the default, that is the easiest way to upgrade. If there was just a dialogue, like there is when there is no index, that would solve the problem. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's not quite that simple. I mean, okay. yeah, I mean, yeah, if, you, if, um, if, everybody, they're glo if everybody's global symbol and, and footprint library tables were what we ship with default, that would, we could do that. Problem is, is I doubt that's the case. I know that's not the case for me. So I would, if, I would effectively be breaking people's configuration. And that's a no-no. I'd rather have somebody just decide that they're going to overwrite their symbol library table, their global table, rather than me deciding to do that for them. So 
and that's and that's part of the problem is why I've we've struggled with this a little bit to come up with a good solution. I mean, I think there are solutions. It just it's got to be a solution. I don't want to step on somebody's config, and that's why it's not easy. Hi, uh, is there an initiative to introduce the multi trace to trace to root the PCB? I think there is. Uh, so you're interested in bus routing, right? Yeah. yeah, it might happen during the V6 development cycle. So I have a question actually about uh, some of the UI stuff as well. Like more generally, like um, I see a lot of feedback on Twitter about people like, well, I can't, you know, I can't use it with my touchpad or I can't do this or that. I mean, what are your general thoughts about uh, usability across all uh, across the the wide swath, like Wayne was talking about too, like the expert users versus the novice users. How do you balance all of those things together? All right, the yeah, shrug. Okay. We saw the shrug. I'll, I'll take this one because this that that falls on me. That that falls squarely on my shoulders. I, and and this is probably partly my fault. Um, I've done a poor job of letting users know what the goal of the project is. The goal of the project, and and the reason I got involved was to make the best possible tool for engineers to use, design, you know, PC board designers, right? And so, because it, my attitude was always the hobbyist market's full. There's, even if you don't, even if you use, there's lots of free proprietary um, stuff available. Almost every board house, major board house has a free tool that you can download and do hobby stuff with. Now, that being said, I'm not going to, it, it comes down to this. Here's the way I view it. If I have to make a choice between throwing my power users under the bus and my hobbyists under the bus, sorry, hobbyists, you're losing. Um, but, we, no, we do, really in fairness, we try not to, we try to make it as usable as possible, but there are like some, there are some high-powered features, like some of the stuff Seth was showing you today. Not many people do, that, do work like that, Okay. It, but I, we want to support those users because they're an important part of our user base, right? So it's it's a balance. It's you know it's 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 a balancing act. I have to try to, you know, like I said, all decisions like that fall on my shoulders. And so just so you understand where I'm coming from as a as an engineer, and and that's why KeyCat has moved. I think that's one of the reasons KeyCat has moved as successfully as it has in the direction as it has. Is I, I'll give you an, I, I, I had a great story. Of, uh, somebody came to me. And, with a, a little demo thing they had working on a, a, a cell phone. And, I, and I'm an old guy. My, my eyes aren't what they were when I was 25, right? So I'm looking at this board and a cell phone, and I'm like, you know, with my glasses on, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, 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 I'm expanding it. And I can, oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm expanding it, and I can see, like, one via and a little trace coming out of it. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's great, but what are you going to do with that? Who's going to, what, you know, I mean, Look, I've been in this business, I've been an engineer for 32 years, and I've met a lot of designers. I've never seen anybody sit down and go to try to lay out a board. I mean, I just don't see, I mean, it's a great, it's a great, those kinds of things are great demonstrations that, of technology. Hey, we can do that. But how practical and useful is that for a guy sitting around doing a, you know, a 700 pin FPGA? Probably absolutely worthless. I mean, what are you going to do with that? So that's kind of my thought process as I go through and make decisions about KeyCAD's design is, 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 that, is that practical for somebody who's going to sit here in front of a, a CAD package for eight hours a day and work? So, but so now you know. Now you know what the, the goals of the project are. Uh, hi. So kind of going along with the power user stuff, so how do you guys follow trends in the general CAD industry? So like, um, Stuff like an ODB export or uh, following IPC standards for exporting, or moving along with like what some of the bigger guys, the paid options are doing. You want to take that? You do a lot of the evaluation of the big tools. Sure. Okay. So, uh, starting with the the file formats, I think there there's a couple of things that impact uh, whether or not we're able to you know quickly add support for file formats as they get introduced uh, and uh, become either de facto standards or actual standards. Uh, one of them is whether or not we have enough uh, development resources to, um, to put into it, of course, like any other feature. 
But another part is that a lot of these so-called industry standard formats are proprietary and it's hard to get uh, free access to a complete specification for them. So you, know, you mentioned OBD++, I think that's kind of in the category of a feature that would be somewhat tricky for us to implement and test because in order to fully test it, we would need this uh, proprietary specification and uh, commercial tools to test against. Uh, I think, you know, on where where we can support new uh, new file formats, where we can get access to it, you know, we want to move with the industry as fast as we can. You know, things like Gerber X2, uh, things like you know, IPC, uh, whatever the number is. <laughs> so, uh, and then uh, past the file formats, in terms of you know where commercial tools are are setting trends, uh, I. I'm mostly speaking for myself here, but I think the rest of the people on the development team are, you know, as receptive. We want to pay attention to what the state of the art is in ECAD. Uh, we don't want to say, oh, because KiCad is an open source project, we're going to do it the open source way and, and we're never going to look at commercial tools. I think there are some ways in which commercial tools have not been able to keep up with KiCad um, in terms of usability and feature set at a certain uh, price point or accessibility, uh, but there are also certain places uh, where the commercial vendors are able to invest a lot of time and money into R&D and to push things forward, and uh, a number of us have access to and regularly use these commercial tools, and we're able to take inspiration from them and note what they do wrong and know what they do better and uh, use that to guide where we want to push KiCad in the future. Uh, so. Uh, I was wondering if you guys have any plan to add like a DRC check for uh, too much too much skew on a diff pair, things like that. Yes. <laughs> the whole uh, DRC system more... is going to get completely overhauled. You want to say more? Right. Yeah. So so apart apart from the DRC, uh, there uh, John I, I know has put, uh, pushed a lot of. Uh, put a lot of thought and effort, work so far into overhauling DRC um, as far as um, improving our overall support for, um, for parametric design and updating of the elements on board to match that parametric design as you're designing. That's also coming in uh, in KiCad 6, we have a uh, specification document uh, that we've kind of hashed out for that uh, called um, track refining that has a number of those parameters in there uh, that goes kind of hand in glove with the, uh, with the DRC specification that, uh, that John, John work, uh, is working on. Raise your hands a little sooner, that would be helpful. <laughs> Uh, thank you, everyone, for having this conference. I had a quick question on DRCs. Um, Cadence has a DFM kind of built-in tool with their software now. And since I'm a PCB manufacturer, I really like that idea. Uh, have you thought about not just uh, DRC, but also DFM within the tool? Can you, can you define DFM real quick? Um, Does, so DFM is designed for do manufacturing. Do you have a specific example of... of of what kind of parameter uh, in DFM you'd be looking for that is that is currently missing. And it might help us to kind of organize whether or not that fits into uh, one of the elements we're already thinking of. I have a list of like a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> Can you file a bug report? <laughs> I th yes. Um, so. I, I can give you one real quick. Um, so clearance, uh, clearances on uh, plane layers, um, drill, how close is your drill, the actual physical drill to a oh, clearance, right. okay. things like that, which um, you probably haven't solved for. Some of that is going to go in DRC. Um, I don't think we've had any discussion so far on a dedicated DFM check, um, at least none that I'm aware of. Um, so. Probably not six. Uh, you saw the length of the list already, so probably not six. But um, like what said, uh, it's not. I'm 
I haven't seen a bug report uh, requesting that yet either. Um, so uh, strongly recommend putting uh, the bug report in as a wish list and then uh, encouraging all of your customers who want such a feature to go out and check the yes, this affects me too um, on that bug report. Kind of the more information that we have about people who would use a feature, because it's not a feature that, that I part personally need, and so I'm not, it's not conscious in, it, I, I use the DFM from my manufacturer's website. I don't think of it as something internal to, uh, to KiCad, but maybe a lot of people do. And the only way for us to judge that is if you put the bug report out there and then a whole bunch of people go and jump on it and say, oh, yes, absolutely, we got to have this, right? Some people look at the heat on the, bu on, on the bug. I, I know I, I do. Jeff, Jeff Young, who isn't here right now, I know that he, uh, he uses that to prioritize his work as well. So uh, not, not everyone does, but, uh, but, uh, but some, some of the devs do. So if uh, it's more likely to get addressed if a bunch of people want it. Right. And so any, put it in the bug tracker, get people to sign up and say, yes, that, that, that affects me, and then, um, you know, maybe seven. Is there any, is there any um, risk of that turning into a, a Bodie McBoat face for, uh, for KiCad? <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking again about the DFM, so many tools, uh, they offer uh, simple DFM checks as a part of their DRC. By simple, I mean things like the minimum uh, hole size, hole to hole distance, whether there is silk, silk screen on top of uh, exp bare exposed copper. So this uh, will likely become a part of, uh, of KiCad DRC checker. Uh, but for more advanced manufacturer specific rules, uh, well, we need, to, we need to have feedback from you. What is needed for how many users have advanced Great. Well, speaking of some feedback, let's give the, uh, all of our speakers here, all of our panel members, the feedback. I, I, think, uh, I think John showed on the screen earlier uh, the, some of the screenshots of, like, the thanking the developers. I see that over and over on the forum, and it's literally, like, obviously we'd be nothing without you guys, so I really appreciate it. Uh, we are... Uh,